What's up, guys? I'm Kate with Type Match, the dating app that matches you based on personality type compatibility and arms you with the tools to understand yourself and your needs so that you can build healthy, happy relationships. Now, I'm sure everyone has heard the old adage that opposites attract, but is this actually the case when it comes to personality traits? Well, we find that when it comes to the big five personality aspects that stands for um, it's also called OCEAN, an acronym for openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. This is not actually the case and is better for you to be in a relationship with someone who matches more closely to you on these personality aspects. So let's go through them one by one and talk about the compatibility for each of the five. So the first aspect is openness. This measures a person's willingness to engage with new things and in creative and intellectual activities. You know, you could also call it openness to experience or open-mindedness. And people who score high in trait openness are, of course, open-minded. They are imaginative, curious, original, artistic, they prefer um, a lot of different interests and activities rather than just narrowing down on one or a few. They like to, you know, kind of explore the world and they're curious about a lot of different topics. However, you know, every positive comes with an equal negative. So there's no such thing in the big five as a good personality trait or a bad trait. Everything is on a spectrum and it comes with its equal um, benefits and downfalls. So the downfalls of being high in trait openness is that people often struggle to follow through on their creative endeavors and they struggle to stay grounded and can have difficulty managing practical everyday tasks. Now, a lot of people conflate trait openness with um, intuition in the Myers-Briggs, but they are not the same thing. And it is actually great that they're not because otherwise the Myers-Briggs would lose all utility if it could just be measured through trait openness and um, the big five scales. So on the opposite end, low scores tend to be more um, traditional, practically minded, down to earth, and they have like a more narrow range of interests that they like to focus on. They like to stay more like in their box and they know what they like and they're comfortable with these things. So they can have trouble if they are faced with a lot of uncertainty in their life. And, you know, they prefer to stay with what's familiar rather than just like exploring a lot of different topics just for the fun of it. Now, just by logic alone, it does not sound like these two people on the opposite ends are very compatible with each other. Of course, people, a lot of people fall in the middle of these two. They're more balanced and, you know, they can swing more one way or the other and be more compatible with different people on this. But for people who are low or high, they really need to be with someone who is very similar to them, you know, scoring like within... 20 points of each other on uh, trait openness, because we can think that the conversation just isn't going to flow as well. And they're not going to want the same things in life. The person who is really high in openness is going to want to explore a lot of different ideas, go to a lot of places, try a lot of new things. And the person who is very low isn't going to want to do that with them. And it's going to make them just feel kind of unsafe and nervous. And I want to stay with my things that I know that I like. Also, um, trait openness and trait conscientiousness are tied to a person's uh, political beliefs as well. We find that people who are high in openness and low in conscientiousness are more likely to be liberal, whereas um, the opposite people low in openness and high in conscientiousness tend to be more conservative. Of course, not like 100% of the time, but this is a, a trend that has been noticed. So again, that's not the best for a, uh, a romantic relationship, being opposite on the political spectrum. 
So it's just two different ways of looking at and approaching the world. And so that's um, why it's best if you're really more close to each other in terms of this spectrum to avoid conflict. Second, uh, trait conscientiousness. This measures a person's orderliness and their ability to control their short-term impulses and delayed gratification for the purpose of achieving goals. And this also has to do with a person's um, lawfulness, their proclivity to obey authority and rules and to, you know, be orderly, make lists, and to want to check off everything on that list. So a person who's very orderly, they're going to have an orderly house, orderly workspace, they're going to want everything, you know, in line, because they have their goals, and um, they're going to just, you know, have more of a schedule for themselves, whereas a person very low in orderliness, their space is likely to be more messy, they're more likely to break rules, they're more likely to, you know, <laughs> engage in crime, um, and to kind of be free flowing in their day, let their day happen to them, keep things open. And so we can see that these people, while they can have a lot that they can learn from each other, um, being on opposite ends of the spectrum is could cause a lot of conflict in a relationship where one person, the or the conscientious person, is making all the plans, um, doing all the dishes right away, and is annoyed that the other person just seems to like hang out and not do anything, while the other person, the person low in conscientiousness thinks that the other person is uptight and nagging them and they just cannot seem to to meet because of their natural way of being in the world even though as a person matures and grows they can um, grow into like more middle of the road um, they still have their their natural tendencies one way or the other Trait three is extroversion. Um, everybody knows what extroversion and introversion are. And in terms of the Myers-Briggs, it takes on a whole extra meaning in terms of how you primarily take in um, information in the world and make judgments based on that information. And it's not just like the typical extroversion and introversion definition, but here in the big five it is, it is like, where do you primarily get your energy from? Like, you know, do you focus it externally in the social world? You like to go to events, talk to a lot of people that's engaging and energizing for you, or does it drain you and you need a lot of alone time? So the typical definitions for extroversion and introversion, once again, as people have argued, it is on a scale as the big five says, with most people falling more in the middle. Now, in terms of romantic compatibility, I would argue that this aspect out of the five is the least important with um, the most important aspects for romantic compatibility being conscientiousness and openness. And that's why in the tight match compatibility system, we rate those two, um, we give them a higher weight than we do extra version in terms of your overall tight match compatibility score. So, um, but where it really matters for these two, you can see there's more green space, there's more blue space because it's, it's more fluid um, and more open than the other two aspects. But where it really matters is people on the extreme ends, the super extroverts and the super introverts, they're just not compatible with each other in a romantic relationship. They want to engage in different activities and um, they just, they're gonna kind of drain each other. And, you know, it'll be like the extrovert, being like, why don't you ever wanna go out? You know, you never take me out. And the introvert being like, why can't you ever calm down and stay at home? Or like, you are too loud and talking too much. You know, they're just gonna make each other tired.
Number four is agreeableness. So this measures how people tend to view and approach relationships with others. It includes measures of politeness and compassion. So those that are very high in agreeableness are more trusting and sympathetic of others, whereas people low uh, in agreeableness, the disagreeable people are more suspicious towards the intentions of others and take a more critical view of the people around them in the world. Agreeable people are, are sensitive to the feelings of others and may put the needs of others before themselves so they can have trouble with people pleasing because they want to be helpful and cooperative. Um, people perceive them as forgiving, soft-hearted, courteous, but they can have trouble with getting taken advantage of. Where on the other end, disagreeable people think that, you know, people's feelings are their own business, their own responsibility. I'm not going to intervene in that. They're less sympathetic and supportive in emotional matters. And um, they may ignore social niceties for the sake of efficiency, but they're much less likely to be taken advantage of. And in fact, people who are higher in disagreeableness, so lower in agreeableness, are more likely to get a promotion because they're not afraid to go and ask directly what they want. They don't feel bad about it. So for compatibility, we're seeing the same thing again. Of course, these people, again, are very beneficial to have to in each other's lives with the disagreeable person making sure that the agreeable person doesn't get too taken advantage of and the agreeable person maybe like softening up a little bit the hard edges of the disagreeable person. And, you know, they get sort of mimic each other, each other's strengths and learn a lot. But in terms of a relationship, it is, again, better if the person is somewhat close to you in agreeableness and disagreeableness, unless, again, you're on the extreme ends and then you need someone who's a bit different from you. And then trait number five, neuroticism measures a person's propensity to experience negative emotion. So that accounts for emotional stability and how positively or negatively a person perceives events in their life. So someone who is high in neuroticism is more likely to experience anxiety and depression, to feel nervous, high strung. They, if they're very high in neuroticism, they can appear emotionally volatile to others, whereas they might just call themselves passionate. Um, but they are, they're sensitive to negative events and um, maybe we could call these like the, the HSPs. And, but the, you know, a really positive thing about being higher in neuroticism is they are more able to detect threats in their environment. Whereas a person very low in neuroticism, they are super chilled out. They, they never get nervous or, you know, depressed or moody. They're like more like the cool, calm cucumber, but they may miss a lot of, you know, threats and problems in their lives that don't spur them to action. And then they're going to end up in a, in a bad place. So once again, it's, it's useful for these two to, to have each other in their lives. Um, and they can learn a lot from each other, but in terms of compatibility, once again, for the fifth time, it's better if they are closer to each other in this aspect, unless they're on the very extreme ends, because you can think about a person who's very, very high in neuroticism. They can't be with another super neurotic person because they're just going to build each other up about all of the worries and like negative possibilities that could happen. Or it's like, I'm worried about this. I'm worried about this too. We should really worry because of this. And they're just like, amplifying the anxiety rather than like having someone slightly lower um, to calm them down. Now, if the person is too low in neuroticism, it's not going to calm uh, the neurotic person down because they're like, you just aren't capable of seeing this. You never get excited or nervous about anything. And um, on the end of like very, very low in neuroticism, it's helpful for these people to have somebody who is slightly higher to be able to detect um, 
negative possibilities and threats in the environment and with other people. So we do have a big five test on our the TechMatch website, which I will link below, as well as a link to all of this information. You can also take it on the TechMatch app. We have this quiz, as well as the MBTI personality quiz. We're incorporating other ones. And then you can look at um, your compatibility scores with your matches. We, we break it down by each aspect, like how compatible with you, uh, how compatible are you with this person in terms of neuroticism, openness, MBTI, and then we also include like an overall tight match compatibility score. So then, you know, just understanding these things about yourself can help you have a healthier relationship, even if you are not compatible in these traits, like, okay, now you understand where this other person is coming from and that they are different from you in this aspect and you have a fundamentally different lens through which you are viewing and experiencing the world and you can learn to learn and from and appreciate each other's traits rather than criticizing them or having them cause conflict in the relationship. So please give this channel a like and subscribe to support it and check out the Type Match app, links below. Your personality is unique. It's hard to find someone that understands you. Try dating using personality type matching. Find out who you're compatible with using Myers-Briggs and Big Five personality scores. Download Type Match and start dating by personality type compatibility today. Type Match, available on App Store and Play Store.